Next point on what not to do is don't start a startup if unless you're exceptional. Okay, this is what I was talking about earlier in the video. If you want to build a $40 million tech company, great, but you need to be exceptional. And by that, I mean hard metric, exceptional, quantifiable, measurable intelligence. Just because you're a smart guy and a hard worker is not good enough. I feel like I'm a smart guy. I know I'm a very hard worker. You might be a very smart guy and a hard worker, but that's not enough, okay? You need 150 IQ and to be a rock star developer. The kid that I'm talking about who went MIA and who had no work ethic, that guy was exceptional. He should be worth, you know, $40 million, but he's not. After he left us, I heard he went to another job and got fired because he wasn't doing work. I mean, he took a job making $70,000 a year when he should be in business making, you know, $700,000 a year at least because he is a literal genius. He could build the next Facebook. He could, he could, that kid could build anything. I saw, I really saw when I was watching him, I saw up close what exceptional looks like, at least in terms of tech. And I really realized that I didn't have it. And neither did Zach. Both of us are high IQ guys. I'm exceptional in sales and so is Zach. Uh, but, and our business acumen is, is pretty good, but neither of us can program a microwave. And it was like, I, I realized there's no, there's no way I should be in, in, in tech when I'm competing with guys who are exceptional, right? Okay, you take a guy like Mark Zuckerberg, he's super exceptional in intelligence, super exceptional in business acumen, and super intelligent in sales. I mean, he's, he sold his way into um, major, major VC partnerships. And I mean, that's who you're competing with in tech. And, and I've just got no business competing with a guy like that. And I know it. So that's something that you really, really have to take in, into consideration. If I'm talking to you and you've got a 150 IQ and you've got insane level programming, all bets are off, man. Go give it a shot at tech business. But if not, man, I don't think, I think it's a mistake to get into it. Next point on what not to do. Um, this is if you choose to do a startup, okay, if you are exceptional, don't join an accelerator. Uh, an accelerator, if you don't know, is a collective of successful entrepreneurs and basically help launch your company for a percentage of your corporation, okay? And it sounds like a win-win proposition, but in, in practice, it's a bit different. So our accelerator didn't do a whole lot for us, except introduce us to some VCs and potential mentor, mentors, all of who we could have met through cold calling and FaceTime. But in hindsight, we wouldn't have even bothered because they did not care about us until we had traction. Uh, and I hated working in the accelerator because the owner would come around and try and talk to us as if we were his employees and asking about sales and our sales targets. And he would try and pitch us push us to pitch these VCs after we figured it out. Like they don't care unless we have hockey stick traction. And then he would bring someone into the office and put on this whole dog and pony show when he would get all the companies to meet him in this giant meeting every day for, you know, it took two hours out of our time, you know, that we were trying to work on to build our revenue, wasting time with some guy that's going to go nowhere. So the owner can look good in front of, you know, whoever VC or some mentor or some, some dude that he's bringing in that didn't give a fuck about our company. Okay. And so all that messing around was costing us two hours a day. I hated the guy's attitude and not to men mention the fact that they took like 10% of the company without investing money into it. That was a big thing. Now this was in Toronto. Okay. This isn't Silicon Valley and Toronto had some more prestigious accelerators. This wasn't a particularly prestigious one, but I heard from a lot of the other companies working there that it was better, but it wasn't a whole lot better. Okay. With that said, there's a big, big exception because I can only speak from Toronto. If you are, if your company is able to get into one of those big Silicon Valley accelerators like Y Combinator, totally different story. Okay. You should be, you know, breaking your neck to get into that thing. And believe me, we tried to get into Y Combinator, but they didn't, you know, we weren't, our business wasn't nearly valuable enough for them. It's a place like Y Combinator run by like former Silicon Valley guys, super useful because one, they give you money for a percentage of your company. And two, you've got a, a ton of useful advice and connections from guys who are actually successful, really successful. And a ton of successful companies have come out of that. So that's the only exception. If you can get into one of those top 10 um, accelerators or maybe even top 30 if you're talking about in Silicon Valley. But in my experience, at least outside of Silicon Valley in, in just a major city, um, you know, with 
an accelerator that's not huge, it's 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 even some of the more prestigious ones, it's it's not worth your time. All right, so that's it on what not to do. Now I want to talk about how to get started. All right, so starting the right business, that's key. My, as I briefly mentioned before, my first two businesses were online magazines. The first one was a Vice Magazine clone. Okay, I'm not talking about Vice Magazine now. I'm talking about Vice Magazine back when I was growing up and it was starting out in Montreal and it was super edgy and like, they were just writing about crazy shit. It was really fun. And I tried to do that. And the other one I did was a fashion mag. And, you know, basically in this day and age, most online magazines and newspapers are just hemorrhaging money. I mean, even like the New York Times and all like all the big ones are, are getting smoked. And I thought I had figured out a model because I was getting people to write for me for free. Again, I can sell. So I was getting people that I knew or <coughs> girls that I'd seen or girls that I had dated before to who were writers to, to write for me. And I was, you know, I had like 15 people writing for me for free. Uh, but the quality wasn't quite there, of course, you know, when you're getting free content and neither was the accountability because again, they're doing it for free. Uh, not that I blame them, you know, in hindsight and now I don't accept anything for free. I want people who are, who, who want to get paid and who are serious. And then when I pay someone, I can tell them what to do when it, when you're getting someone for free, it's like, you can't really go too hard on someone because they're, they're doing it for free. Um, and the only companies that are still thriving and growing are companies that have huge backers and are willing to take a loss um, for a while or like boring business to business publications where they're selling overpriced ad space, you know, $30,000 a month ad space for insurance or financial services companies. Those type of magazines are still running. So in hindsight, two magazines were, you know, totally the wrong business. Um, and that took three years out of my life. Not that that was the only thing that I was doing. I was working in sales and then at night I would go home and work on those. But I mean, I could have been three years ahead if I'd started RLD instead of RLD from 2012, I could have been doing it for, I don't know, 2008. Right. 